between this game coming back and Sora getting into Smash, I've run out of souls to sell. Wait! Where, where'd you get the second soul from? Gigantic is a MOBA hero brawler slash shooter made by Motiga and originally released back in 2017. Unfortunately, due to many publisher and financial issues, the original game closed one year later. Thankfully, due to the undying dedication and love of the fan base wishing for the game to return, five years later the game was reacquired by Gearbox Publishing and is now being developed by Abstraction Games and re-released in April of 2024 for all platforms cross-play included. From the bottom of my heart, Thank you. Thank you, Gearbox. Thank you, Abstraction Games. And thank you to our awesome community and everyone else who made this possible. The two months of waiting were excruciating. Gigantic is pretty asymmetrical for its genre. So even though there have been comparisons to other games, it's kind of its own thing. Because of this, allow me to quickly explain. In Gigantic, you fight alongside two guardians. This is Lairon of House Orion. This is Grin of House Devadra. Wait, wait, stop, no! Gather power by eliminating enemies, creatures, and collecting orbs of power that spawn at certain places on the map. When either side reaches 100 power, their guardian will rampage, moving to the other side to pin down the enemy's guardian, doing damage and exposing a wound for your team to attack. Do enough damage to the wounds and your team wins. Simple stuff. But now that there's a new game mode, let me move on to the differences. Currently, there are two game modes, Rush and Clash. Clash is the original mode that older players remember. It's a longer, more tactical game where heroes start at level 1. Guardians have 3 wounds and more total health. This mode also has a clash in the late game. Guardians and creatures move to a smaller portion of the map, and guardians do more damage while rampaging. The clash occurs when there's been a total of 5 rampages or either team's guardian has only 1 wound left. Rush starts on the smaller map. Players start at the max level 10, Guardians only have one wound instead of three, but the health of that one wound is larger than normal. In Rush, you can change your heroes or build mid-match. Rush is more beginner-friendly and faster with matches lasting typically around 10 minutes. Before moving on to the game mechanics, something worth mentioning is that the time to kill in Gigantic is generally higher than most other games. Nothing crazy high, the time to kill is still lower than Demon Slayer. Higher time to kill means engagements may feel slower for some, the upside is that you'll have enough time to react instead of being immediately excommunicated from life, which makes fights feel less frustrating and unfair. This also means you have enough time to leave if things are going bad. Learn to check your ego and accept that sometimes you'll lose the fight and leave. One of Gigantic's most important mechanics is the stamina and movement system. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. You can sprint, jump, and dodge. When you're not in combat, sprinting and jumping cost no stamina, but in combat they do. Dodging gives you iframes and always costs stamina, but as long as you have at least one point of stamina, you can still dodge. When out of combat for a few seconds, health and stamina will start to regenerate. You can regen stamina in combat if you don't perform actions other than walking. Be careful, because completely running out of stamina will double the time for regen to start. Learning to manage your stamina is one of the most important steps in becoming a better player. Here's a tip. Your health is a resource too, so learn to leverage and trade it for value. If you're low on stamina and in a losing fight, stop fighting and walk to let your stamina regen, allowing you to potentially sprint away. This is a high level tip though and very contextual, so just keep that in mind until you get more comfortable with the game. Poking enemies with even a little damage will put them in combat, so tagging someone who's running is a good strategy. New players, no offense, but put the energy drink down. You're not trip, you're not doing the electric boogaloo, stop dodging for no reason. The Rampage Edition introduced an auto-dodge setting that I would suggest turning off. It might be helpful for your first couple games, but it'll become a handicap later on. Melee heroes have a unique dodge and jump attack. Both cost more stamina, but provide a benefit. Dodge attacks charge you slightly forward after your iframes. Jump attacks, if landed on an enemy's back, will cripple them, slowing and reducing their jump height. Alright, crippling back shots, check. Hey yo, what the fuck? What's next? Right, focus. Hey guys, really quick, if you're enjoying the video so far, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more content from me.
I stream every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern if you want to come by and hang out. With that out of the way, let's get back to the video. Focus is a special resource that accumulates as you play that doesn't go away until spent. Focus has a progress bar showing how much is built up towards your next charge. You can earn up to the max of three charges after which you can't gain progress towards more until it's spent. Focus charges have two uses. The first is your hero's focus skill, basically your ultimate. The second use is as a currency for upgrading your team's creatures that are summoned on the power circles. Focus is built up by landing attacks, taking damage, and funnily enough, dying. Each time this happens, you'll get 12.5% of a focus charge. Just keep in mind this is not an optimal method for farming or winning the game. The more charges you spend on your focus skill, the stronger it becomes, which can mean more damage, longer lasting, etc. Keep in mind that using your focus skill depletes all your focus, including any progress towards another charge, even if the bar is 99% full. So if you're close to getting another charge, it might be better to hold off on using your focus until you get the next charge. The second way to use focus is for upgrading your team's creatures. Creatures can be summoned on power circles and provide your team with active benefits, including being able to attack enemies. They quickly collect power orbs that spawn on the points they're summoned at, as well as preventing enemies from collecting them from those points while they're present. Creatures, if killed, give the enemy team power, 10 for babies, 20 for adults. So be mindful of when you're summoning and make sure to protect them. There are different kinds of creatures, each kind has a different benefit and an adult form. While summoning, you're defenseless and the channel can be interrupted, so be careful. Creatures' adult forms have more health, deal more damage, and the benefits they provide are stronger. Upgrading a young creature into an adult costs an amount of focus charges depending on which adult you want, and the process is the same as summoning. Adults cannot be summoned right away. Young creatures need to be summoned, then upgraded. You can summon each young creature twice, but for adults you can only summon one of each. There's multiple different types of creatures. Bloomers have a small area of influence, they have a healing beam and cause healing bloom plants to spawn nearby, and have a slowing attack. Cerberus has medium influence range, they give you vision of enemy locations on the minimap in their range, and have a damaging howl that dazes enemies. Cyclops have a small influence range, they create walls that block certain routes and have a shockwave attack that launches and weakens enemies. Drakes have a large influence range, they launch fireballs from the sky at enemies within their range, and have a ranged breath attack that hits multiple enemies in front of them. Infernals make one-way portals, no cake required. Then there's the obelisk that breaks the rules. Obelisks have a small range and a lock-on beam. They break the rules because not only can you have two adult obelisks, but they can also be summoned on any point including enemies, preventing them from collecting power till it's gone. They do not collect power, but they also don't give the enemy power when killed, making them a good first stage if you're planning to immediately go for an adult anyway. Also, you can upgrade any young creature into any adult. Next up are the characters. At the time of release, there are 25 unique heroes to choose from. The game breaks them up, generally speaking, into frontliners, melee DPS, ranged DPS, and supports. Each character has a basic attack, three abilities, and a focus skill, aka an ultimate. This is where Gigantic's unique leveling system comes into play. Each skill a hero possesses has an upgrade tree that you can spend levels on on the fly as you play. Put simply, each hero has two options for their skill's first level, and then from that it splits into two more choices. So each skill can be built four different ways, allowing players to tailor their hero to their specific playstyle and that specific game. If you want to play Voden as more of a ranged DPS, you can, but if you want to play him as more of a ranged support, you can do that too. At levels 5 and 10, you upgrade your focus skill. Also, at level 5, you choose a talent. Talents are effectively two passive skills, one that's active during battle and another that's active only during the clash portion of the match. In Rush, since you start at level 10, the game gives you pre-builds to choose from. You can also make your own custom build for your own preferred path, which I suggest doing once you're comfortable. And remember, in Rush mode, whenever you respawn, you can change your hero or your build if you want. So if you're feeding the enemy team power like your Duke energy, it may be time to consider changing things up. Some beginner-friendly heroes are Gnosis, Beckett, the Margrave, HK206, Bowden, Mozu, and t -Mat. Also, I have nowhere else to put this, but this hero right here, well, she's not beginner-friendly. This is just a PSA that her name is pronounced Ashlyn. Also, in my house, we say this one's full title. I am Taito, the Swift! No, Taito, no! 
The game has a minimap that gives you a lot of important information in real time. Power orbs spawn roughly every 35 seconds. The timer shows a yellow ring filling up clockwise at their spawn location. If the yellow circle is moving counterclockwise, someone's collecting the orb. The minimap denotes which points are friendly with green, enemy with red, and neutral with gray. You can tell the creature types based on the symbol in the center. This includes the enemies as well, but only after someone on your team has been close enough to see it will the map update. If the creature is blinking red with an exclamation point, it's fighting something. Don't worry, your guardian will announce when a creature is getting attacked too. You can see your teammates locations marked by their hero icon. If their icon is blinking red, they're in combat. Allies who have been eliminated show up at that location as a skull. Enemy players will be marked on the map as red dots when near a Cerberus or your guardian. Guardian's icons display their location, including during a rampage or clash. Pink show up on the map as well, red meaning fight here, orange for caution, blue for on my way, and green for summon here. This part of the video is the true guide, so for anyone wanting a little bit more guide and less tutorial, welcome! First, I'll explain how those funky yellow numbers you sometimes see work. In Gigantic, Crit Chance works a little different. The Short King version is that Crit Chance starts a little above 0% for everyone. As you land basic attacks, your Crit Chance will start to build up, and basic attacks are the only thing that does crit damage. Crit damage numbers are bold yellow instead of normal white, and the crit damage by default deals 20% more damage. The rate of build is different between heroes, so Mozu, for instance, builds less per hit than spin, but Mozu attacks much faster. Crit chance will start decreasing back towards the base amount after going a couple of seconds without landing bases. Now that crit's been explained, let's move on to everything else. From here on out, this is a lightning round of information so I can keep the video under 15 minutes. First, there are a number of crowd control effects, buffs and debuffs. I won't be reading each one, but on screen right now I have the list for them, so feel free to pause and read them. Guardians do throw out attacks as they rampage from one side to the other, so be careful about giant circles popping up on the ground. Guardians will attack any enemies that get too close, so if they're not pinned, avoid them. Any power the defending team has when there is a rampage will decrease the damage they take when they're pinned. This includes any kills between the rampage starting and the pin. If the defending team gets an E-limb during the pin, it adds shield health onto the wound. If the attacking team gets an E-limb during the pin, it will increase the timer. Getting eliminated once the rampage is over will give the opposite team a head start on power, so if you're about to be removed from the census anyway, sometimes it may be better to let them get you right before the timer runs out. In settings under interface, you can turn on a kill feed and a status effect bar. The kill feed shows you player deaths and power events. The status bar will display any buff, debuff, or CC you or enemies are currently under. In gameplay, here are some settings you can turn off or on depending on your preference. Auto sprint out of combat, auto skill upgrade, second tier upgrade UI, and sprint toggle. As an experienced player, I prefer the first two of those off and the last two on. Also under your settings for your controls, you can change your skill navigation. I prefer classic. In rush mode, you can change heroes without dying by finding jump pads near your guardian. Jump attacks for melee heroes give you a very slight boost up and forward, so there are some leaps that you can make doing this that you normally wouldn't, especially if you're moving slower or not sprinting. This can also be used when escaping, as it can change your trajectory depending on where your camera is facing when you start the attack. You can use this to get behind cover or even cause attacks coming at you to miss. Just keep in mind it does cost more stamina to do, so this is more helpful when you're getting shot at or trying to move around the map out of combat. Also, you can dodge mid-air. Think about which creatures to summon where. Cyclops and Cerberus are good options for common rotation routes. Cerberus will show rotating enemies on the minimap, and Cyclops can block off certain routes, forcing a certain path. Adult Drakes are very strong and require coordination to remove. Having them at your forward points helps them provide you with occasional firepower when fighting closer to the enemy's side. Creatures regenerate health slowly over time when not taking damage. They have a shield over them when no enemies are nearby, so ranged DPS can't snipe kill creatures unless someone on your team is close by. All creature types while inactive also have a slight healing aura around them. They definitely don't heal as much as a bloomer does, but if you're just escaping dying, sitting next to a creature will heal you faster than waiting for self-regen to kick in. If you're dying a lot, try figuring out the reason why. Is it your positioning? Are you often by yourself? Are you struggling to win engagements? You could be playing a squishy character that is safer near your team. 
Try fighting from positions that put the enemy at a disadvantage for coming after you. Whether that be behind your front line, behind cover, high ground, off angles, or near a creature. Front line's job is to be the push for the team. They often start engagements, soak up damage, and peel for their team. They can also do a hefty amount of damage too, but need a team to really get value. Pay attention to your team's location. As a front line, you have two targets, the other front line or the back line. A tank can get a lot of value going for the back line, but only if your team is helping you. If you're not as confident in your abilities, your team, or the enemy front line as a problem, focus the enemy front line. As the biggest target, you will often draw the most attention, so use that to your advantage. Assassins. You can potentially build yourself to be tankier, but in essence, we are opportunists. It's best to try going for low health targets or sneaking into the back line rather than brawling in the front. Pathing is important, go around the sides. The front lines are a distraction. Go for the Imani or Beckett player in the back. If the enemy starts focusing on you, leave. You're the most mobile class in the game, and for that reason, you typically shouldn't have that many deaths. If you're dying a lot as an assassin, reevaluate your positioning, pathing, and your tempo of engagement. It's much easier to attack the back line when everyone else is distracted, so let your front line do their job before going in. Even if you don't get an elimination, forcing an enemy to retreat can sway the fight in your team's favor. Don't go too deep for a kill. Sometimes it's better to let them escape than to chase them down and risk death. Trading death for death isn't always the most strategic. And if they keep getting away, screw it. Go satisfy that bloodlust killer. They can't run forever. Oi! Just want a hey yo, what the fuck? Range DPS. You are one of the safest class, so take advantage. Use high ground and cover. Position yourself within your effective range that forces others to go out of their way to attack you. If you become the target, run. You aren't meant to fight close up, and many melee DPS have the ability to punish you if you try. Outplaying them that close as possible, yes, but just remember you're not in your effective range, you're in theirs. So do it at your own risk. Since you often have the ability to poke and do damage first, you can be the person that sets target priority. Shooting at the back line can give your assassin someone to target when they get low. You can also aid your front line by pumping damage into the opposite front line. Which is better in the moment is contextual and you'll need experience for. Supports are harder to summarize for, but you take a little bit of advice from every previous class minus assassins. As a support player, your biggest asset is supporting your team, whether that be through healing, buffing, debuffing, or crowd control. You're often a target number one, so you need to play carefully. Generally, you want to be behind your front line. If you're Zendora and you're the only front line, well, I don't know what to say other than don't be a coward. Zendora is a front line support, so always be with your team and push. Support should always be with their team. If you have the ability to save someone without dying in the process, do it. If your teammates are wildly out of position and putting you at risk, it's okay. Let them fuck around and find out. They'll learn. Don't baby them. That's right. I'm your white mage. And nobody f***s with the white mage. Also, don't be a hillbot. The best defense is a good offense is accurate in basically any game known to man. You don't have to worry about healing as much if the enemy is dead. You should be trying to put out some damage when you can, but remember, your title is support, so that always takes precedence. Let the assassins thirst for kills. That's their job, not yours. The most important tip I have is to have fun. If you're not doing the best at first, don't get discouraged. Keep trying. You'll find your character, playstyle, and get comfortable in time. I normally don't make guide videos for multiplayer games because anything I say is subject to both change and scrutiny. So as much as I'd love to get you to join the Trip Army by telling you she's the best character and that anyone who disagrees and doesn't like her is probably a filthy Beckett or Mozu player opposing the Lightning Regime, I can't really do that and remain factually correct. Also, hello Mozu players, you get a pass, I like Mozu too. Death that being said, it's best to do your own research and learn as you play. Ironically, I currently have plans to start a guide series for each of the heroes, but we'll see how that pans out in time. All that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm Tiger Falco, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the airship. Peace.